Hello, my name is James Gray. I'm the co-writer and director of the film Ad Astra. It's a strange thing seeing the Fox logo at the head of this film. This film was made by a company called New Regency, headed up by a man named Arnon Milshan. But by the time the film was completed, 20th Century Fox had been purchased by Disney. It's a strange thing. I never thought this film would be released by Disney. When you want to make a science fiction film, well, it's all about space, right? It's all about the allure and the magic and the romance of space travel. It was very much my intent to make the opposite of that. I had seen many great films made in the tradition uh, of, of science fiction. I, 2001, obviously, is the touchstone for practically all people uh, working within the genre. But almost all, in all cases, the films are preoccupied with the notion of alien life. In 2001, uh, Kubrick doesn't depict aliens at all. So they remain an abstraction. So he beats the trap of having good aliens or bad aliens. He offers up an idea of false gods. Now Spielberg is another matter. With something like E.T., for example, he beats the trap too, but he beats it in another way. The film takes on a kind of metaphorical meaning, that the film is no longer about a guy searching for aliens. The film is really about a young boy and his loneliness. And that E.T. is really almost like his imaginary friend. So the film plays like a fable and is brilliantly successful on that level. So armed with this knowledge that I had about what science fiction films had come before, it was my intent to make a film which addressed a central comment made by Arthur C. Clarke, the co-writer of 2001 and a, a a brilliant mind. He said either we're alone in the universe or we're not. Both ideas, both ideas are equally terrifying. So we'd seen a lot of films, as we've just discussed, about aliens, but never a film where we're alone. Where what if there is nothing out there? What if we are all that matters? And we felt that we'd never seen a film that covered that territory. There is no viable plan that we have to set up a colony anywhere else on any exoplanet that will provide the same resources and the same uh, succor that the Earth provides for us. If you look at the news today, there are any one of a host of articles that say, oh, there's this exoplanet, it's a Goldilocks planet, there could be life on this planet, there could be life here, there could be life there. And really, it's not very interesting, is it? Because if the life is an organism that is basically a single cell organism, you can't have a conversation with a euglenoid or a paramecium, right? You can't have a conversation with an advanced form of life that's so advanced that we can't connect with it. So what good does it do us? We're alone in the universe. And that idea, that central idea, was what governed all of the creative decisions in that astral. And I'd wanted to begin the film with a bang. And that the father's reach would somehow hit Roy back on Earth. That there would be this big construction, this big tower, which would speak to our ambitions as a species to look outward. But what does it mean to look outward? And that Roy must fall back to Earth in order to survive. You'll see here this lunar shuttle. It was our intent to show that space travel would be in the near future, more developed to go to the moon, that that would be the domain even of some kind of space tourism, so that there would be uh, commercial systems that would bring us to the moon. This was our intent to give a grounding to all of the, uh, the settings and all the spacecraft. Human beings may be more technologically advanced in the years to come, the 50 years to come, 100 years to come, but that human behavior doesn't change. May I have the blanket and pillow pack, please? Sure. $125. We like to remind ourselves and you, well, you'll be able to go to the moon, but you've got to still pay for your pillow. What does it mean to look into the future? Well, looking into the future, most of our answers are wrong. Most predictions we make are wrong. So knowing that already, what we tried to do was simply look at the present or look at 50 years ago or 100 years ago and see what has changed. 
Well, for men, not very much. Fast food restaurants existed 50 years ago, that's for sure. They'll probably exist 50 years from now. All the hopes we ever had for space travel. Just a recreation of what we're running from on Earth. And we tried to say with the moon, okay, how do we look at what the moon will be? Well, let's look at parts of the Earth that haven't been exposed thoroughly. Well, there's been a huge call for natural resources. It's like the Wild West out there. There'll probably be some kind of lunar treaties among nations. So knowing that there might be some kind of international lunar treaties, knowing that there would be natural resources, knowing who we are as human beings, well, that means it's people clamoring for natural resources because there would be lots of no man's land on the moon. How could you govern no man's land on the moon? Hence this sequence. I'm interested in the most plausible version of science fiction. So that is to say, they're going to Mars, they're going to Neptune. There's no realistic way that we can go to Neptune in 79 days, as is said in the film. But is it plausible in the next 50 to 100 years? Maybe. So we decided to stick with the plausible. Some might feel, I don't understand this. They have to go to the moon to go to Mars. Well, on the moon, one has to remember there's only one-sixth the amount of gravitational pull that the Earth has. That means that a rocket can be smaller or have less thrust in order to leave the lunar gravitational pull than the Earth's gravitational pull. So in the future, we will probably have the Orion spacecraft, which is going to take us to Mars. That will take off from the moon. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? A lot of the motivations of the of, in the film were simply to do things that were not technically possible before. We had uh, done a lot of research about the Martian surface and about exploration on Mars. Uh, the movie The Martian with uh, Matt Damon, the Ridley Scott film, which is a wonderful movie. Uh, we had to do something different and we had to try to be as uh, true to what Mars would be like as we could with all of the most recent technology and photography of the Martian surface. We used real photographs from the Martian rovers as a basis for the Martian surfaces and the exteriors. So again, this might be the first movie to be shot on location in Mars. We do know that Mars has underground lakes. Many are frozen, some may not be. We also know that Mars has what's called lava tunnels. So the most plausible idea for a Martian base would be these tunnels because they're already dug underground for us. They already exist. So we depicted, uh, we felt that Mars would play best as a kind of underground version of what an Antarctica base is for us right now. One of the other things that you learn or when you do research on astronauts, astronauts have a very good sense of the Earth if they're 200 miles above the surface of the Earth, that when they see the entire Earth, their psychological state is not in question. They're still grounded and rooted to who we are as a species. But what people have found is that the Apollo astronauts, those people who have been to the moon and looked up and seen the Earth as a celestial, just one celestial body in a sea of other celestial bodies in a vast darkness, that all of a sudden the psychological questions become quite different. Loneliness creeps in and how that forced a reassessment, an existential crisis really, what it means to be a member of the human race. Now you'll notice of the 12 astronauts that landed on the moon, almost all of them entered a period of real crisis. Neil Armstrong went to his farm in Lebanon, Ohio and you didn't hear much from him from then on. And Buzz Aldrin has been very open about his battles with uh, alcohol and other substance abuse. Uh, Edgar Mitchell uh, talked of aliens, and Charlie Duke became a born-again Christian minister. There was uh, a real need by the men who saw the Earth in such a state to try and attach some kind of greater meaning, a real existential crisis they had to undergo. So you can imagine what it would be like going as far as Neptune and what it would do 
to our psyche. So we had decided that we were going to depict this man, Roy McBride, as a very lonely figure. In a way, it would be a perfect astronaut for the system because they would need people who were loners, people who were not necessarily questioning their inner lives in order to be successful out in deeper in space. I had come across an article about astronauts that they were trying to recruit for a Mars mission, where people will be in close quarters next to each other for a year and a half. Much as I adore my children, if I'm with them for a whole day, by the end of the day, I'm tearing my hair out if we're in close quarters. If you can imagine if it's a year and a half, you would need a very special kind of person. You would need someone, frankly, with what we call schizoid personality disorder tendencies. People who are very, very comfortable with being alone. I really appreciate my privacy right now. Without any kind of human contact touch, just very comfortable functioning within their own systems. If you look at the interviews with Neil Armstrong, for example, who without question is one of the more remarkable human beings in the history of the human race, that the lunar landing, Apollo 11 landing, is possibly, no, I'm not going to say possibly, I'm going to say definitely the single greatest achievement in the history of man so far. But if you listen to him talk in that first press conference he gives after he's finally released from quarantine after landing on the moon, we had difficulty with closing he talks like an engineer. The, the system had 6.6 uh, six six pounds per cubic inch of oxygen. oxygen. He's not connecting with the more metaphysical aspects of what it means or what it meant to be the first human being to step on another celestial body. Well, I think that was intentional on NASA's part, that Neil Armstrong was both the perfect person for that journey, the perfect astronaut. Well, we felt this contradiction was perfect for a character that would have to go to Neptune. The sequence was meant to uh, express the absolute bizarre unpredictability of the journey and of space travel in general, and of what it means for earthbound creatures to be in space. Behavior becomes completely different. The situations, the issues, the ideas that we face, the crises that we face, become of a very different order. In space, that endlessness, that void, that infinite, forces us to abandon all practical considerations, all practical concerns, Everybody in the movie wears one of these spacesuits now, right? This is how they survive. The only thing you have is that void. And that void is not bad, it's not good, it is indifferent. And it is cruel in its indifference. And so this forces, this aloneness, this separation from the Earth, this lack of practical distraction, forces the inner dialogue. It forces the inner monologue. This is another reason why we felt that the voiceover became necessary. I don't think that NASA, although uh, certainly they've tried, but NASA uh, has not really been able to understand exactly the implications on the human mind of deep space travel. That was the preoccupation we had uh, in the film. There's been a lot of discussion lately about solitary confinement as being a form of cruel and unusual punishment, perhaps even worse than the death penalty. That people who go through solitary confinement, it is the most punishing form of torture for the mind. And you start hearing internal voices, you start flashing back on parts of your life. Absolute agony for anyone, apparently, who has had to go through it in prison. So we felt that that was the closest analogy a uh, trip to Neptune where he'd be in some form by himself for week upon week upon week on end, and the punishment that his mind would have to take on his trip to Neptune. There was nothing. No love or hate. No light or dark. He could only see what was not there and missed what was right in front of him. Joseph Campbell and Hero with a Thousand Faces, the book that he wrote about the myth of the hero. If you guys haven't read it, you should definitely take a look at it. George Lucas relied on it very heavily for the Star Wars films, and Francis Coppola relied on it when he did Apocalypse Now, and, and Stanley Kubrick did when he did 2001, and 
So many directors have relied on, on this kind of template for telling the story of a hero. And then one of the things that uh, Campbell discusses over and over is what he calls the boon. The hero returns with something of great value. And in this case, the boon was a negative boon. The boon was the knowledge that we may well be all alone as intelligent life uh, in the universe. But it's also ennobling because the idea could be that we're very special. Now, it could also mean that our time on this uh, earth is limited, that the great filter, the mass extermination of the species is ahead of us. But it could also mean that we've advanced past that point of the great filter. We've advanced past the point of the dinosaurs and that somehow our species will survive. So we had endeavored, Ethan and I, my co-writer and I, to make a film which was about being alone in the universe, which we felt had never been done before. And we thought this was um, the perfect means by which to tell the story of a man's emotional awakening. Brad's uh, performance uh, is beautiful.